Good afternoon and welcome to my 2018 housing market predictions. I'm Kathy Fetke, co-CEO of Real Wealth Network, and I'm excited to present to you some data that you've probably already seen and probably already known about, but I spent a lot of time looking at slides and trying to figure out what happened last year and how that might impact the next year and what we can expect when it's been very difficult to know what to expect, at least for me. So I will share some of the ways that I was on track from last year's predictions and where I went totally wrong and uh, was kind of caught off guard. So this will be fun. <laughs> it's time for true confessions. All right, so here's the disclaimer. I guess the first disclaimer should be that I actually cannot predict the future. So let's just start there. I'm doing my best to look at data and stats and hunches and put together a lot of the news that we do every day and how that relates to what's coming. But, uh, you know, I'm doing my best, but it may or may not be accurate. So <laughs> uh, just take the data that I share with you and come to your own conclusions. I think that's the best way to go about it. And certainly, if I end up talking about anything tax-related or legal, uh, be sure to check with your own counsel to uh, make sure, or just to see how it applies to your specific situation, or just to ask if it applies to you. Of course, past performance is no guarantee of future results, but it does help us to just get a snapshot of what's been going on to help us figure out maybe what's going to continue to go on. All right, and of course, while every effort is made to maintain accurate and current information, there could be some errors. So here we go. I'm going to talk about what I used to believe and after looking at the data, what I now believe. So you've been hearing me say this if you've been following the Real Wealth Show or listening to me at all at any of our events, that these are the factors and the metrics that we look at when determining which housing market to go into. And we've been, we've been pretty darn on like every year uh, with using these statistics. So it definitely works we follow job growth which then drives population growth which drives demand which drives affordability or not so if there's lots of demand and not enough supply to keep up of course we see prices go up if there's too much supply not enough demand we see prices go down so that affects affordability and affordability of course affects cash flow and that's what we're looking for if you're looking for equity then cash flow may not be as, as important of a factor you may just be looking for demand and if properties are somewhat affordable, then you could probably expect prices to continue to rise if supply is down. Um, and less of a factor has been interest rates. I've told people, I've uh, been uh, interviewed a lot on national radio and TV about interest rates and should we be concerned and how will it affect the housing market. And for the most part, I've come back to say I'm not worried about it because, sure, in the high, high priced markets, there's any little needle could pop the bubble in, in those markets and interest rates certainly could be one anything that affects affordability but for the most part most of the country is still fairly affordable there's just certain markets that are not and if you're in those markets then you you are vulnerable to you know like I said any various factor that could pop the bubble and it could be interest rates but in general uh, people don't not buy or buy because interest rates are low or high. It's, it's really not the reason people buy property. They buy property because either they can, they can qualify or they found a house they love and they want to be in it forever and maybe want to not get kicked out so they want to have ownership or they want to customize it or get a loan and pay it off. So back in the 80s we had a housing boom even when interest rates were in the 18 percent and on Sunday, I, I asked how many people bought back then, and lots of hands went up. And one one guy said he paid over 20% interest rate and was still buying property because the economy was booming and salaries were were up. And it you know just again wasn't a factor. But when interest rates were at all time lows in the three percent, just in in 2009 and 2010 or whenever it was, in an effort to jumpstart the the housing market, uh, we couldn't get anyone to buy homes. You know. It was, it was more affordable than it's ever been, and, uh, you know, the interest rates weren't a factor. So that's pretty much been my belief. And as a result, we have been right on in our predictions of housing markets, getting into the Dallas market in 2004 before anybody thought that was a cool thing to do, um, you know, just getting into Cleveland when everyone thought that was a, a crazy idea, 
now in Detroit. I get lots of people making fun of me, especially on YouTube, which is which is fun because I just reply, you know, yes, it's people like you that make people like me successful because the more you don't realize what's going on, the more those of us who do will profit. So I, I'm good with it. But, you know, we have been uh, ahead of the curve a lot, almost always. We were in Atlanta in 2000. Well, six or whatever, and we got out when everybody else got in. Although we're starting to see some some areas where there's still possibility of cash flow. So um, let's talk about how the charts have changed this a little bit. All of this is still true, but the bigger question is, what creates number one, job growth? Because that is really what housing and real estate is dependent on. And something there's another factor there that influences job growth and what is it? What is it? I'm sure there's lots of factors but what I noticed was something really glaring um, this time around that has caused job growth that I think we all need to keep our eye on because it is concerning. So here it is. Housing now, these are my new beliefs, housing is now uh, is most influenced by the money supply and, and the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has the ability to increase or decrease the amount of money that's out there circulating and and that therefore affects the economy which then affects jobs and affordability and you know the factors so there's a couple of steps before jobs that we really need to be paying attention to so you're not one day going wow you know look at all these jobs and the next day going where did all the jobs go and and the reason I share these things is I've been there many times and uh, it's no fun when the market changes or the uh, the direction of the market changes suddenly when uh, when you've made all your decisions based on where things appear to be headed only to find out that it's not true at all. Um, an example would be North Dakota. Um, you know, investing there when there was massive job growth and then within a couple months there wasn't. And that market just dried up and that was all based on outside pressure and forces from OPEC as you know. So. Um, these are situations you don't want to be in. Now, a lot of the investors that invested in, in North Dakota knew that risk. Um, they took the risk because the cash flow was insanely good uh, and worth the risk. And even when rents went down substantially, uh, we found a lot of people were still cash flowing because the cash flow had been so substantial before. But even so, you want to know what, well, again, I, you know, we, we let people know when you're in an area like North Dakota that's 100% dependent on one economy, you're you're pretty vulnerable. But again, you know, if the numbers are good, you know, sometimes it's worth the uh, taking the risk. For a lot of people who went into North Dakota, they got so much cash flow, they got their capital back, and it didn't really matter at that point, um, you know, where, where the market headed. But anyway, let's go on to the money supply, because this is really what we're going to be talking about, and everything is based on right now because there's so much confusion out there about what's going on. A lot of people think that we just have a robust economy for various reasons, but it's important to look at what those reasons are so that if you can pinpoint what's driving all this growth, you can keep your eye on it in case every, anything changes in that trajectory or in whatever it is influencing this. So, um, you know, let's take a look at this money supply. If this doesn't uh, say something to you, then, you know, it should, and let me explain it. Back in look at look at the 90s, we you know what the growth is since the 90s, and in particular, uh, 2008. So we saw here um, these darker lines are recessions. Um, so of course we know that there was uh, you know a couple of factors that happened. We had 9/11, and we had uh, you know the dot com bomb, and so there were some some pretty serious quantitative easing to, to stimulate the economy after that. And I remember at the time, and you might remember too, that it was really unprecedented, the amount of money that was thrown into the economy after that. Uh, people were concerned, like, wow, where's this going to go? We've never done this. Now, um, as money was put into the, thrown into the economy, well, um, you know, we created a lot of bubbles from that, and we know what happened in 2008. And you can see here uh, another couple lines um, showing the recession. And instead of correcting sort of what caused the bubble, we did more of it. So to fix fix the uh, this massive recession and basically a run on the banks, a lack of liquidity, we did something that couldn't really have been done before but can be done now. 
and that is just create a whole bunch more money. And you know, if, if you find yourself in financial trouble, how how much would you enjoy having a little printing machine at home that just makes more of it? Uh, a lot of us call that credit cards today. <laughs> you know, you apply for a credit card and bam, you got some more money. Or you you get an equity line and bam, you don't have financial issues uh, until until you have to pay that debt. So you you better hope you you can. So throwing money into the economy, um, you know, sure, that's going to fix some problems. Look at look at how wonderful it is to suddenly have a, a few extra trillion bucks to, to throw around. Why not? So let's just keep your eye on this chart and take a mental picture of, you know, kind of a slow rise and then a, woo, you know, major, major rise in the money supply and how that compares to these slides. So looks a little familiar, doesn't it? Here's the Dow Jones. Now, what happened you know, in the in the 60s and 70s, in the 70s, basically, that things just kind of took off, and and you know, there's a few things. One is that you have baby boomers who kind of became of age in uh, in that time frame, and such a such a large group of people that suddenly had jobs and were investing and and in, uh, growing the stock market. The baby boomers grew almost anything they touched. So there was that, but there was also uh, Nixon, who took us off the gold standard and basically made it easy to print money uh, and not have it be tied to anything at all. And so you can see, as more money was poured into into the uh, economy, look at look at the kind of massive growth that it created. Now here's another chart that looks somewhat familiar, doesn't it? Um, you know, you see the recession, and then all of a sudden you see. Uh, housing prices just soar in certain markets. That looks very much like the uh, the increasing money supply. So, more money circulating, more people have uh, access to credit, more jobs can get started. I mean, more businesses can get started by borrowing money and hiring people and and so forth. So, you know, you you see a very similar growth pattern there as Denver and Seattle. So, not every city in the U.S. has charts like this, but some do and. If you're in those markets, you, you just need to pay attention because your growth seems to be oddly connected to the exact same growth lines as the money supply. So I'm going to do a very quick and probably not very thorough or very accurate um, description of the fractional reserve banking system that we currently have, but I'm going to do my best. So if you want to really understand this, there's books that, that explain it much better than I can. I'm going to give you just a very broad kind of understanding of it. So here's this this little dude and let's just imagine that that's maybe you. And you know, it could be a male or a female and you know that's your dollar. You've got a dollar and you you deposit it into the bank. And so you put it in the bank as a deposit. Now the bank says, "Hey, you know, you just deposited this. You don't probably need it. It's going to sit here for a little while." So instead of just having it sit there, how about I lend it to this guy who just came in the bank and says, I want to start a pizza shop because pizza seems to be doing really well. People want it, especially now that there's more uh, legalization of marijuana. The pizza demand has gone up tremendously. So I am going to open a pizza store. So they borrow the dollar that you deposited. And uh, and so that new business says, I want to, you know, I, I need to buy some cheese and some goods. So, uh, you know, that this guy takes the dollar and buy some cheese from from this guy from this farmer or gal and uh, and now she has a dollar because she just sold some cheese to the pizza guy who borrowed the money from the bank to get that money and now she's got she's got the dollar she just made profit uh, and she puts it in the bank so now you can kind of follow that you originally had the dollar it got lent out somebody else paid somebody else and that person put it back in the bank thinking it's her dollar, but whose dollar is it? Because you you have one in there too. And now there's two people claiming it. So who gets it? Well, that's the problem when you have people going to take their money out of the bank all at the same time. It just simply isn't there. And and that's what banks try very hard to avoid is a run on the bank. And, and the, as long as people just trust that everything will be okay, everything will be okay. Uh, so you just, you know, don't take your money out and you'll be okay. But if you did, you'd have a problem. 
because uh, you have two people fighting for it. So basically what this is is creative bookkeeping that banks call their balance sheet. And um, you know, I think if anybody, any of us started a business like this, we would, you know, be pretty well off because it's it's a uh, money magic. You could take that one dollar deposit and turn it to three, four, five, six, seven dollars just overnight because most banks take the deposit and lend two, three, four, five, six, seven times uh, the amount that's in there. And so the way that they, you know call it you know the way that they determine a balance sheet is how much they kind of owe it's kind of how much I owe you and how much you owe me basically assets versus liabilities so I owe you because you you know you put your deposit in here and I lent it out to somebody else and that person I lent it to owes me so I can pay you and it's all just a bunch of paper and uh, and so every again everything's totally fine as long as that paper gets paid back it's when it doesn't that all hell breaks loose and we already know what that looks like. So how else besides not paying uh, debt could this little, you know, little dance go wrong? So let's say that there is just so much profit in pizza that you just say, man, I just talked to Joe and he's making all this money from pizza. I want to I wanna open a pizza store and I found I could just go to the bank and get the money and do it, so I'm going to. So all of a sudden, you got a bunch of people opening pizza stores, and now there's a, a supply-demand issue, and so one of these pizza guys is maybe not going to be as good as the other, or there's just not enough people to buy it all, and so one of these guys is going to go out go out of business, and suddenly can't that person can't pay their debt, and they also have to fire a bunch of people, and, and that could continue. That's what that's why having too much money circulating can be a problem and that's what creates bubbles and and so if more and more people can't pay their debt and the banks you know suddenly the, the balance sheet is all messed up uh, and people want their money back because we have now a recession we have a problem because the money is just not there and this is exactly what happened during uh, the subcrime subcrime <laughs> I said that on Sunday, and I, I thought it was the funniest thing, and I just did it again. I swear by accident, but I think I'm going to rename it as the subcrime crisis. But um, that's exactly what happened, causing Lehman Brothers to collapse, the fourth largest investment bank in 2008. And this this model that I'm explaining, I will credit to Bill Gross, who who uh, kind of came out with it. And I put that picture of Domino's up there because it's a pizza, but also it's the dominoes that kind of all fall when this system doesn't work. And it wasn't just Lehman Brothers, right? AIG, um, you know, major uh, Wall Street giants just collapsed because it didn't work. It didn't work. And it was mayhem. Do not forget this day, September 14th, 2008. I have a, a best friend, one of, one of Rich and my best friends, who will never forget this day because he was doing uh, work, he's a contractor, and boy, when you're at the peak of the peak, and there's money flowing everywhere, everybody's happy, everybody's getting contracted, so he was doing high-end work on a major hotel, and being a good businessman, he paid all of his employees, and paid for all the goods and everything, and did the work, and was waiting for this very large national uh, hotel chain, very, very distinguished, to pay him. He was owed a million dollars, and on September 16th, or whatever that is, 14th, that uh, million dollars was supposed to come his way. It never did, because there, it just didn't exist. Money, the money supply just crashed overnight. So, here's a, a few more slides to take a look at. Uh, debtor nation, consumer credit. Look at that, um, massive increase. Uh, consumer credit per person looks very, 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 very similar to the money supply, doesn't it? Look at this. Not not only are we in debt, and our kids now have national uh, student loan debt has nearly quadrupled since 2003. More students borrowing and taking money out, and a lot of these kids, I'm starting to see more and more because I have a college student, will take out a, a big, huge student loan, and then maybe go to college for a few days and decide they don't like it and quit, but they still have the loan, and they can go live on that loan or spend it or travel or whatever. So 
lot of people don't realize that student loan debt doesn't always get spent on on school. It's a it's just a loan, and uh, kids that drop out or or maybe don't use it all use it on other things. And America is in debt, not just not just the people, but the the country. Of course, we know that during the Bush era, uh, we our national debt went, went debt went from five to ten trillion, and then during Obama went from five to I mean from ten to twenty trillion. And now we have, and every you know we keep raising the debt ceiling. We have a debt ceiling for a reason, which is hey, this is the ceiling, this is as much debt as we're allowed to have. But then the uh, politicians vote and say, nah, let's just raise it a little bit more. Let's, you know, I think we need a little more debt. And uh, that keeps happening. So it just happened under Trump. And most likely we'll see more debt under President Trump because of uh, the tax reform and increased government spending and the things that he wants to do. So we're just going to keep doing this, expanding the money supply. Unfortunately... Um, the uh, GDP is also responding nicely to the money supply. Um, in, in Q3, we had a 3.3% GDP, which is, uh, you know, the president's target. It's the best we've had in a while, quickest paced in three years. Everybody's celebrating. The president is indeed a genius. Look at that. You know, we're all rolling in the dough. And things are good, and the economy is strong, right? And as a as a result, there's an increase in business investment and equipment, which offset moderate consumer spending. So, consumers not spending as much, but an increase in business investment and equipment. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like the pizza guy? Pizza guy going out, borrowing some money, investing in business, but maybe not hiring very high-end employees. So, consumer spending not so good. And then. The GDP was boosted by government spending, which again is uh, more stimulus. The jobs report unemployment rate down to 4.1 percent, lowest level in 16 years. Mostly lower income and part-time jobs, bars and restaurants, but wages do appear to be recovering somewhat. And employment to population is 60 percent. There's a massive, massive shortage of skilled construction workers but an increase in medical hires. So that's just kind of a snapshot. And the markets are responding to this, like, wow, the economy's booming. Look at it. Everybody's happy. And especially anyone who invested in, in the stock market. You know, uh, this, this is where I was wrong in my predictions. I had no idea. I had no idea this would happen. I thought the opposite would happen. Trump himself said the market was in a big, fat, ugly bubble. And I thought as soon as the Fed started raising interest rates, we would see a correction, and I was not the only one, and it has not happened. So why? This, this euphoria just continues as uh, no matter what, no matter what, people just keep throwing money in. So the bottom line is stimulus works. I mean, it, it worked. So we had a big problem. It was only nine years ago. Our financial system literally collapsed until we had Helicopter Ben come in and say, hey, this, the solution is just print a whole bunch of money and save the economy that way. And it worked. And everybody's happy. It's a big party. 2017 will be known for being a, a robust year. Lots of, lots of money circulating. I know I have uh, two, two young girls, young meaning 18 and 25, and my 18-year-old goes to these music festivals that are packed with young kids and the the price tag is like it starts at like six or seven hundred bucks and they're packed like where are these young people getting this kind of money to go party and I mean it's not including the um, you know the whatever they're imbibing and uh, and you know where they're staying and and everything else so just you know lots of parties and it's it's a robust time to be alive kind of like kind of like this time I wasn't there but I heard it was really fun same thing, lots and lots of money. No idea that there might be something around the corner that could end it all. So let's take a look at it, and I think this is really important. So look at the right before the crash. Right before the crash, it was it was just massive exuberance. You know, straight up, not even a gentle. I mean, look, here you have a 
kind of a gentle rise and everybody's like, wow, this is, uh, you just can't lose. Look at, I put my money in here and it just keeps going up and my, you know, my hairdresser did and my neighbor did. And so by the time everybody's going, wow, oh my gosh, look at this. It just keeps going up and up. You can't lose. Then, then goes down a little, starts to correct. And I don't know what did it, but something happened and the market took off until it didn't. And it just collapsed. Then it rallied a little, collapsed, rallied, collapsed, rallied, collapsed, just all the way down, all the way down to the depression and took a, a long time to recover. So if you bought at the peak, you would have had to wait a long, long time to get back up here. Um, and a lot of people, you know, if you're at if you're at age 30, yeah, you can wait. But if you're at 65 and this happens, that's really, truly unfortunate. This is unfortunate no matter what, but really stinks if you're just about to retire. So all this output, the, the GDP, the jobs, and everything that's happening, the euphoria, this is a really important snapshot to understand you know, what's made it happen. So just back before the recession, we had very little debt to GDP, which means, you know, you, it's, it's 62. It, it didn't take um, as much money to produce a 3% output as today. You have to almost, it's like buying a company um, <clears throat> and being 100% or 106% in debt and still only getting the same return as if you didn't have, if you had half the debt. So clearly, clearly all this exciting stuff is due to debt. It's kind of like if you get a credit card and you suddenly feel rich and, and you, you, know, you invest that credit card in a stock, it could go well or it could be devastating. And, and, and look here, this isn't normal. Japan, Japan is way worse than us right here. 250 uh, is their debt to GDP. Italy's pretty bad and the US is third. So uh, we got some serious debt, and uh, look at Russia, not so much, not so much. Maybe oil, gas, I don't know, but we're the ones, we're the ones that have some debts to pay. <coughs> and what's concerning is that the three percent that is uh, as the GDP that that we did make, it's just only enough to pay this, the interest on our debt. This is our this is our big budget. We've got a huge chunk of of our GDP goes to you know of our of our money goes to social security, unemployment, uh, Medicare, health, military, the interest, and then you have these little slivers of other things: education, science. Um, you know, not not a lot spent there. Um, so the concern. I'm not trying to freak anybody out, but you just need to understand that. Maybe some of the euphoria people are experiencing is fake because it's based on debt and, and potentially debt that can't be paid back. And that's where it goes wrong. Debt's, debt's totally fine. To borrow money, to buy a business and have that business cash flow and you pay the debt off with the cash flow, I mean, that's our business. That's a wonderful business. Where it goes wrong is when you borrow a bunch of money and you can't pay the debt, then you lose it all. So you've got... Uh, 60, you've got 10,000 people turning 65 every day, every single day for the next 10 years. So with that in mind, how much do you think this blue and the orange are going to increase? A lot. So where is that money going to come from? We're, we're going to have to really, really increase our output tremendously to, to pay for these people. You know, how, how are we going to do that when already, already 3% our G, you know, our GDP is going to just pay the interest on our debt. It's a problem. And here's another chart I think is really important to just keep in your mind, and that this is the unemployment cycle. So you can see every time unemployment gets real low, something happens to where all of a sudden everybody loses their jobs and unemployment goes up like overnight. And then things get better, things get better. It, dips along the bottom for a little while, and then something happens and everybody loses their jobs. These, these lines are the recessions. Um, 70s, I think it was the oil crisis. I think in the 80s it was the SNL. I think in the 90s, I'm not sure. 2000s was tech and 9-11, and then, <clears throat> of course, the mortgage meltdown. So 
it's always something. So as soon as we get low unemployment, we uh, we have issues. So right now we're down to you know record lows at four percent, and based on history, it doesn't stay there very long. So again, you know, when when everybody's celebrating these things, I I get nervous. The opposite happens. I I don't celebrate. I say, uh oh, based on history, there's something that could be coming around the corner.